Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, while I'm uh, uh, doing the next part, let me invite uh, Laura Tyson and Martin Wolf to join us up here. Um, we'll put Laura uh, at this chair and Martin here. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to to uh, thank all of you for being here. I know today will be a crowded day. Uh, uh, we haven't arranged medals for all of you who make it through to the very end at about 1 o'clock, but uh, I wish we did. Uh, but we should have fun. This will be a journey for all of us. Uh, we have quite a few number of people watching online, and so I want to say a special hello to those uh, that are watching with us. We've provided uh, primers, if you will, materials, charts, information that is all available on the Internet. And, uh, and for those watching at home can have it. I think we've distributed them today. And, and we've, we've also put out some various materials uh, written by uh, 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 Martin Wolf's uh, piece yesterday. We also have Martin's most recent book, Fixing Global Finance. Um, we have uh, uh, articles that, that are, are not yet out. Uh, Leo Hendry's piece in The Nation, which will be out in a few days. We, we've gotten permission from them to issue under embargo to 300 people, uh, uh, the piece, thanks to Katrina Vanden Heuvel. Um, but I do want to thank everyone for being here. What we're going to do today is, in this, in this conference, looking towards the London G20 Global Growth Summit, what will replace the American consumer, start out with a discussion with uh, Professor Laura Tyson, who, of course, was National Economic Advisor uh, to President Clinton. Uh, she's continuing to play a role on the so-called Volcker Commission right now, and as I learned last night, uh, she's the person in charge in America of tax policy. Oh, <laughs> it's a group, uh, it's a group. Yeah, we, we, we talk, the, um, uh, she is, of course, also professor uh, uh, at UC Berkeley in the Haas Business School. Martin Wolf, who hardly needs an introduction as well, uh, is one of the most influential and prominent and, and read economic commentators in the world uh, with his regular column in the Financial Times. And we, we're going to start out with a discussion with them um, entitled, In the Wake of Collapse, What the U.S. Consumer Left Behind. After we finish, and I should forewarn you, we don't take breaks at New America conferences like this because we'll never get you back in your seats. Uh, uh, if you'd like to take a break, you're welcome to. We have restrooms and others in the side, food and whatnot. Just slip out. We're going to keep this going uh, through the entire time, and we'll move hopefully seamlessly uh, into the next session on the search for domestic drivers uh, in an economic recovery with a very distinguished panel. Then, of course, we're going to move to another panel on the international drivers, thinking about the international climate. How do you generate uh, consumption? I, I was mentioning at a dinner we had last night that I found notes from 1999 in an economic summit in which then in Hakone, Japan, very important economic people, this is 10 years ago, said the world is dangerously over-dependent upon an American consumer that it is underproducing and overconsuming, uh, and that was 10 years ago. And so it sort of raises the question of, of what will happen next. And we'll finish um, with a conversation with George Soros and then closing comments again from Bernard Schwartz on our day that we, we've had. So um, we're going to start first with a conversation with, with Martin and with Laura. And what I would, would like first, thank you both for being here. And uh, say hello so we can make sure the mics are working. Hello. You. Hello. Uh, not very well, is it? Uh, there, there you go. I think it's fine. Great. Okay. Martin, why don't we start off with you? Um, you, you we're tilting towards uh, uh, a major economic summit that's happening in your real hometown uh, over in London. Uh, you, you haven't been effusive and optimistic about the chances of this. If you were to, to change your demeanor from being somewhat slightly... Uh, uh, um, I had, what's the good word? Negative, just about the entire. If you were to sort of see something that really buoyed your belief that the that the global economic planners were about to get it right, and you were to wake up and said, "Aha, this really went well." What would what would happen? What would what would need to pass the Martin Wolf test to show that we're back on a credible planned economic recovery? Is there any? And I should add that when I ask when we ask Martin Wolf to do this this conference, and I said, what will replace the American consumer? Martin wrote me back, and he says, I'm happy to do your conference, but I've got one word, nothing. Uh, <laughs> well, um, it's, I mean, the problem with that is that it's uh, sort of unimaginable, because I think we have to separate what they can do to deal with the, the stupendous mess they're now confronting, which is effectively what they're going to be doing. They're going to be doing rescue operations. I've got to distinguish that from having uh, some confidence that they have a plausible and agreed understanding of how we got here, which in my view has to do with systemic failings in the international financial and monetary systems going back decades. This is not 
uh, simply because a few regulators screwed up in the US. I think it's extremely important to understand that. Uh, it's, the, it's the end game of a series of massive bubbles which we have needed to balance the whole world economic system during this particular globalization episode. So this is a very profound systemic problem that they have ultimately to resolve. Now, in, since I don't expect them either to agree on this, because some the, the surplus countries in particular simply don't agree, they don't recognize the problem they cause, um, I, don't ex I don't expect them to come forth with a full understanding of this. So let me say what I think of the, the minimum program, and I'll leave aside what used to be called the maximum program for the moment. The minimum program, uh, to be reasonably confident we'll get through the next year or two, is, uh, would consist of two parts. Uh, a credible commitment across the globe with the biggest commitments in the surplus countries to expand nominal demand, important in the deflationary environment, to a point at which uh, a large part of the burden of generating incremental demand over the next few years does not fall on deficit countries. Um, because I am very concerned that what is happening is exactly the opposite of that, and we're going to recreate the imbalances problem, this time with the US government, the US fiscal system, as the borrower of last resort with consequent pressure in the so long run. Surplus countries, China, Ch above, Japan, all, above all China, Germany. Japan and Germany. The oil exporters are not in the same situation. They are the most important structural surplus countries. You need a commitment from them. Second, it is clear that at the very minimum, in order to deal with the immense problems emerging economies, in this case, I'm leaving aside the very big ones, face because of the withdrawal of funds from them consequent upon the financial disaster and the guaranteeing of all the, the, the loans of all our major banks, which has pulled capital from all the world into the major banks in the, in the, in the major um, developed nations. They, the emerging countries need fund funding, uh, and that can only be done through, at the minimum, a very large increase in IMF resources. Um, Tim Geithner has proposed $750 billion. Um, I think that's sort of the minimum. It's important to remember that the world has generated, almost entirely in the emerging countries, uh, um, an increase from $1.5 trillion to $7 trillion of reserves over the last 10 years, and that expresses how much insurance they want in order to play in the global game. So $750 billion of IMF resources is pretty small. That's the sort of minimum that I would want to see. The chances of, of achieving both are, I think, very small, but they're not zero. Beyond that, I want them to start getting to some sort of agreement of why the international financial and monetary system has been so consistently unstable and what needs to be done to fix it. But I'll leave that for the moment. Laura, um, you, you help advise the Obama administration at this point. But if, you know, as you sit in there and you sort of look at the team that he's got there, what, how would you outline the priority of tasks that they've just got to get right? And, and without compromising yourself, what do you think needs to be added to the package uh, in terms of them getting it right? What do you think is sort of missing, not happening, or do you, would you give them an A-plus uh, in, in, in how they've been performing? <laughs> well, I should say something in advance, which is the President's Economic Recovery Advisory Board is a totally independent organization, so we don't speak for the administration, so I, I think that's important to that, start with. That means your answer will be better. Uh, it just means what it is. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I think uh, President Obama has uh, said it right. Uh, this is a, a new team. It's what, now just about 50 days, and they face an economic uh, crisis that, of the proportions that we haven't seen since the 1930s. Um, we entered this, the U.S. entered this, not in an ideal state. Uh, the administration, the previous administration, had added $5 trillion to the uh, debt. Uh, we had, and I think this is very important since we're going to talk about consumption today, we had a situation where from 2000 to 2007, the median working family household had their income decline in real terms by approximately $2,000. And that median working family was, uh, if you look at how they were overspending their money, what they were using their house to borrow against. In most cases, it was not for frivolities. It was for the things we consider 
middle class Americans, all Americans, should have as part of their life. It was for the education of their children. It was for health care. It was for transportation. It was for insurance. And it was for their home. So uh, I, I think that is really important because so mu a basic guiding principle in the administration's policies, whether they are financial market policies or long-term deficit reduction policies or immediate stimulus policies, is to keep that fact in mind. There is a sense that the erosion of the US economy is tied deeply to the erosion of the uh, income and spending power of that middle class family. Now, as far as uh, the things they've put together to do it, you know, they've been amazingly consistent. I, I did work on the campaign, and I would say if you look at the stimulus package and you look at the long term budget that was put out there, they have clearly said stimulus, the important thing is to put in programs that spend out quickly or that help those who are most adversely affected, the, the unemployed, the people who lose their insurance because they lose their job, the people who are on food stamps. But they have also said, where we are spending money, uh, we want to spend on essentially priorities that will also be part of our long-term <coughs> budget plan. So you see it in the area of the environment and uh, energy. You see it in the area of health care. You see it in the area of education. If you look at the big spending priorities in the stimulus package, they are exactly the same spending priorities as in the long-term budget, which is exactly right. And the idea is to try to use the stimulus. A key challenge, uh, Bernard, and it's really a challenge, is you're trying to get money into the economy quickly, quickly. And I'll tell you, it's really going to be hard to get that health information technology into the economy quickly, that spending. It's really going to be hard to get smart grid money into the economy fast. It's really going to be hard to get energy efficiency money into the economy fast. So they try to find a, a bundle of packages that will do that. So as far as the uh, budgetary and stimulus packages, I think they really work together. And I think the problem, the basic problem here is uh, the budget, the longer term budget, and the sustainability of that depends very much on the pace of the economic recovery. And sadly, the historical numbers here are not on the side of the administration. These kinds of banking crises last longer than a year or two. The unemployment effects last through about five years. The housing price effects last through about six years. So the problem is going to be these long-term deficit and debt numbers. And what Martin is worried about, if the US government goes down this route, is it sustainable? Is it sustainable? Um, and by that, I think he also means, will the rest of the world finance it? Because let's be clear here, the financing will be exactly the same <laughs> as it was in the past several years. It comes from the surplus countries. Uh, so their willingness to finance it is very, very important. Um, on the area of the uh, financial market, and I'll, here I'll, I'll stop, I personally don't know whether to give them an A, B. I don't know what to give them, but I think that is very reflective of a reality. A majority of economists from the left to the right might agree, and indeed do agree, uh, that economic stimulus in this kind of setting is absolutely required, that deficit spending is absolutely required. A majority of economists might even agree, I think, yeah, we've been underspending in the United States on infrastructure. Yes, we have a long-term underpricing of carbon. They might, they might agree on that. Economists are very confused about what's the right thing to do for the financial market crisis. There isn't a clear answer because, in fact, it's very much tied up to confidence. It's also very much tied up to what the US government can afford to do. You know, Some of the plans out there, uh, let the banks go insolvent, let the government nationalize them. The government, the, the, the Congress is not going to give the administration money to do that. That was one of Martin's concerns in that piece yesterday. Part of getting a resolution to the banking crisis that some people recommend is simply not right now politically in the cars of the United States. So they have come up with, I think, a very clever plan to leverage private money 
to try to restore some confidence by pricing some assets and taking them off the books of the banks. There hasn't been a plan like this tried before, but you can see how you get to it. And so I give them uh, certainly an A for trying, and we'll sort of see what happens. And, and, I, and I dare say, I don't think there is a clear cut, this is what they should do idea out there anyway. Let me ask you one question about that last point. Um, one, one of our uh, uh, program directors here, Doug Redeker, jumped on this the other day, and, 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 and a friend is. of yours, uh, <laughs> and, and said that you're, you're, getting, you're seeing an opportunity that the administration has provided essentially to subsidize holders of wealth to regain uh, an investment in, in, in sort of very dilapidated and eroded price structure and then sort of enjoy the bounce back. Why not create instruments for those individuals who have seen their 401ks and whatnot uh, uh, fall out to sort of participate along with, you know, the, the, you know, the, the big money guys? Well, I, th I think, I mean, Doug should speak to his proposal. I think what I would, that right now the, the idea is we cannot get the financial system functioning again until we get the key, the key in parts of it functioning again. The only way to help the 401k affected uh, is to basically help revive uh, the equity market values and the housing values. The only way to do that is to restore the functioning of the credit market and the only way to do that is to deal with the regeneration of the securities market and uh, finding a way to convince confidence in banks and to increase their lending capability. So I, th I think that's so essential to get done first that I can see why they focused on that. Let me read the last bit of a Martin Wolf article that came out on Tuesday. He writes, the conclusion, alas, is depressing. Nobody can be confident that the U.S. yet has a workable solution to its banking disaster. Right. On the contrary, with the public enraged, Congress on the warpath, the president timid, and a policy that depends on the government's ability to pour public money into undercapitalized institutions, the United States is at an impasse. It is up to Barack Obama to find a way through. When he meets his group of 20 counterparts in London next week, he will be unable to state he has already done so. If this is not frightening, I do not know what is. Um, <laughs> it's Who wonderful. was this pessimistic fellow? No, it. well, yeah. Um, I don't but, want to have anything to do with him. But it, it, it seems to me, and I, and I think that there, there, there are a couple fascinating things about the, the, this period we are as we, as we tilt towards April in this meeting. One is whether or not the general strategy that Tim Geithner and others are putting together essentially assumes that the U.S. economy can bounce back to what it was, largely have the sort of same contours, the same design, the same social contract. Consumers will somehow bounce back into a confidence that they can overconsume again and, 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 and move forward. Or you, you, you are where Martin Wolf is, that fundamentally, and, 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 and frankly where Bernard Schwartz is, that you've got to somehow re- orient and rebalance that economic system for longer term survivability and get to these issues. And so I do have this, this question for both of you. Do you think when we're talking about the American consumer, the American consumer lived in a world of such confidence that, they, that w w whether or not they were, they were spending money frivolously or not, they had confidence that if their job, that it was the Alan Greenspan line, that yes, jobs are getting torn up in American society, but they're being created just as quickly. And so you had just-in-time jobs, just-in-time money. You could, you could just-in-time opportunity. And so th there wasn't a savings that, that, that was needed because opportunity would, would, would just happen. When you compare that to Japan and China and other states that other people who don't trust their governments, institutions, or their futures, they save like crazy. And so I'm interested in whether or not this shock in this institution, what we're seeing un, un, unfold, will, will fundamentally change the way Americans look at their position and whether we'll ever get back into an economy. And that thus undermines the very you know, foundation of what Geithner and Summers and others are, are, are trying to organize. Uh, Martin? Okay. I mean, first of all, obviously this um, con conference, quite rightly, is about the U.S. It's in Washington. Uh, it is important to remember that the U.S. wasn't the only country that had a large housing bubble and in which uh, both residential investment exploded and, and borrowing by house households exploded. Um, in aggregate, probably the economy is concerned uh, accounted for something between 35 and 40 percent of world demand. So it depends on exactly who you include. So it's a much bigger problem even than the U.S. Mm -hmm. And it's important to remember also when we think about the solutions 
that the US households alone spend twice as much as the GDP of China and India together. So we are, we're talking about something uh, very, very big. This means um, what I thought or hoped would be a relatively slow transition from what I think of as overconsumption, overspending, and overspending on residential investment would, uh, as a result of the shocks of the last six months, looks now as if it's going to be a very swift transition. Uh, already, it's quite clear when we, we don't know the figures, but it's actually arithmetically absolutely clear if you do the GMP accounts for the US uh, and you look at the likely current account deficit this year, the fiscal deficit, uh, as a matter of arithmetic, the private sector financial surplus this year in the US is going to be at least 15% of GDP. This is <coughs> staggering. Uh, from the private sector financial balance was negative a couple of years ago. So this is a massive swing. Uh, so what we, what much of that I presume will be in the corporate sector, uh, non-financial corporate sector, but quite a bit of it will be in the household. So we're going to see this adjustment very, very quickly and brutally. And that's implicit actually in the GDP forecast of your own, uh, of your own government. It's just not put out in that, in that way. Now, the biggest question then is whether that lasts. That is to say, are we shifting in the countries which had the characteristics of the housing bubbles, the very elastic credit systems oriented to supporting household spending, and we're thinking particularly of the English-speaking countries. Um, Spain is one of them in this way, to some degree. Um, will they uh, remain frugal for the indefinite future? And I think there's a very good chance of that. If you look at the Japanese story, though it's slightly different in some details, it had, they have one central common element which is not discussed enough here, and that is the staggering overhang of debt yeah. in the context of collapsing asset values. Last year, a household uh, net worth in this country declined by $11 trillion, according to the Fed. It is important to remember that over the last 20 years, roughly 25 years, the ratio of private sector debt to GDP in the US has almost tripled to a level never seen before in US history. The UK is worse. Therefore, it seems to me, just to conclude this, very plausible, though we can't be sure, that households are going to be trying to spend down their debt and accumulate wealth in this context over a long term. It's very plausible that this could go on for many years. Indeed, very simple back of the envelope calculation suggests to me it could go on for a decade. A decade. If that is the case, it's a perfectly plausible case. I'm, it might not be that. Then, of course, the demand engine structure that we are familiar with will disappear. I have one friend, a uh, um, very well-known economist at Harvard, who told me it's flat out. US consumption is going down from 72% of GDP to 62%, which was where it was three decades ago before all this started. So then the question of what replaces it is absolutely central. There are domestically, you can have corporate investment. I think a massive boost to corporate investment in this context is very implausible unless supported by government. You can have government spending on consumption investment, and you end up then with huge structural government uh, budget deficits, which can be more better or worse used, and I agree completely. If you're going to have very large structural government deficits for a long time, the sensible thing is to invest. There's no doubt at all about that. And the final thing you can do is, is hope for the US that you have a massive improvement in the external balance, so you move into surplus from the current account deficit. That can make a big difference. But of course, by definition, that means somebody else moves into deficit. Hmm. If the economies that are moving, making this switch are at least a third of the world, the rest of the world has to make a very big adjustment. And that has to come from the surplus countries because the deficit countries out there are all bust. <laughs> Every last one. The Central and Eastern Europeans are the last region of the emerging world to have run significant current account deficits. There have been a series of them, Latin America, East Asia, now the emerging markets, and every one of them has ended up bust. So they're not going to do it. So if we don't get adjustment in surplus countries in a big way, there isn't a way out of this, from, uh, except, coming back to it, this huge fiscal burden. So I think, I really do think, uh, but I'm not completely sure of it, that this set of possibilities that I've just spelled out, which seem to me sort of obvious, but maybe I hope I'm wrong, but it's <laughs> sort of basic logic, is not something that the people in the administration want to think about 
because it's too horrible. Mm. It really does mean operating in a very different environment. And there's a small footnote to that. If this macroeconomic story that I've been trying to tell for many years, many, many years, is roughly right, then the financial problem is largely, I'm not going to say any more, largely a symptom of this past failure, macro failure, and curing it, though it's clearly a necessary condition for recovery, is not sufficient. Because mm. the problem, as the Japanese experts will tell you, you don't have the borrowers. Right. Mm. You, having a perfectly fixed financial system is wonderful if there are vast numbers of willing, enthusiastic, creditworthy borrowers. Right. And the problem of the world is the only willing, enthusiastic, and creditworthy borrowers in the whole world now <laughs> Our governments. Right. Before we go to Laura, uh, and then before we open to the audience, would you grade for us, Martin, how you see thus far those surplus countries, particularly China, Japan, and Germany, admitting and picking up their responsibilities as we as we go towards the G20? Okay. Is Japan okay. doing what it should do? China, okay. and what me, about Germany? Let me describe how I see it. First of all. Um, uh, none of them are, it will accept the analysis I've given, uh, which is a problem. Uh, that is to say, they see themselves as entirely innocent victims of the irresponsibility of overspenders. Uh, and, uh, and that's a problem. Uh, the unwillingness of people who, uh, to recognize that the uh, uh, general equilibrium system is a general equilibrium system is a problem. And, uh, and so that's a difficulty. Um, and we haven't got anywhere in persuading them of this obvious thing. Now, the, the second question, nonetheless, on a self-keeper basis, they are, on the whole, reasonably creditworthy countries, so they could do something even without admitting that they are in any way at fault or in any way even responsible for this situation. It seems absolutely clear that overwhelmingly for domestic reasons, uh, in the way that China can do these things, which is through the fiscal system and spending and, and the banking system, the, the Chinese are taking stimulus very, very seriously. That's increasingly obvious. My worry about the Chinese uh, approach is that they are not addressing the, the causes of the structural underconsumption, which, by the way, are not because households save so much. They don't save so much by developing countries. It's because household disposable income is 40% of GDP. That's, and if you think, you know, you've got the, the middle income, you know, the, the medium income problem in the U.S., the, this equivalent in China is much, much bigger. Mm -hmm. It's the problem is the income distribution. This is the most capitalist country in the history of the world. If you judge it by where income goes, it goes to the owners of capital. And who are the owners of the capital? The government. Now, this is really, uh, really important. <laughs> to understand in the Chinese case, but they are making a big effort. Nonetheless, the current account surplus of China will certainly remain very, very large. Um, Japan is in complete disarray. Its current account debt surplus has, of course, disappeared because its markets have completely disappeared. It's, G it's the, the most severely affected G7 nation by far, and I don't think we can expect anything from Japan at all. Uh, I my perception of them is they are in the most terrible crisis now. Uh, at the end of the 20 years of great difficulty, or 90 years of great difficulty, and I'm really, I really, really feel sorry for the, the position they've now got themselves into. Um, and of course, the government is very weak. Do you uh, think the Barack German, Obama invited the, Taro Aso to be his first guest because was, he felt sorry for him? Uh, I have no comments yeah. on that. <laughs> yeah, but I think the Japanese difficulties are now very, very large because they got out of their crisis in significant measure through an export boost coming via China indirectly from the U.S., and it's gone completely. It's imploded. And that's an incredibly, that's the decline in GDP is now expected forecast by consensus forecast at close to 5 or 6% this year. This is a massive recession. I'm just incredible. Germany um, is being pushed in the direction of stimulus. Its actual stimulus package is not that small. Um, uh, um, starting from its baseline, its fiscal deficit will increase significantly. But it is important to remember that even so, it will remain an enormous surplus country. It doesn't, has, has never seen its fiscal, its demand boosting obligations as related to its surplus position. And as I've tried to argue uh, 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 um, here and, and will be more in the paper, 
because of the enormous current account surplus, which has been almost $300 billion, which is incredible for, for a country which is after only a quarter the size of the US, um, it's simply sucking out demand from the whole European system. And, and it, it is putting its partners in the most incredible pressure in this situation because they can't take Spain, for example, or Ireland, or the Eastern Europeans, they can't export their way out of their problems, which is the natural way for countries with serious problems in accessing foreign capital to do They need to ex export their way out of their problems, and Germany is their biggest trading partner. So I would say Germany is trying, but it doesn't recognize that it has to move towards balance. Otherwise, the European system doesn't work. So I will, in all, um, no agreed analysis Quite a lot happening in China in the short term, though no structural change, I think, yet seeable. Japan is in great difficulties, and I think Germany is fundamentally, despite what will not be a bad stimulus effort, in denial about its responsibilities within the European system. I'm not talking about the global system. Mm. Thank you. Laura? What's the question? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, is Tim Geithner protecting Wall Street too much? <laughs> No, that wasn't the question. Uh, I, I know that wasn't the question. Uh, I'm trying to think what I can add to. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think what I can add to mine. Um, first of all, uh, I, I do want to say a little bit more about uh, government uh, spending and government debt here, because while I agree with Martin that it is, in, it we are systemically in a situation where the huge danger is that the countries that the main country that seems to be able to, at least for the foreseeable future, borrow a lot is starting with a relatively large debt to GDP ratio and a scary deficit. And, uh, but still, but still, I, I, I do not want to leave the impression that I don't think there is uh, a role for um, government deficits and government debt in the U.S. and other countries that can build it up. Again, the historical record of financial crises suggests that the government debt tends to go up by at least 100 percent. I mean, the government has to because it is, has the only balance sheet, the only borrowing capabilities. It has to fill in while it tries to uh, correct, modify the collapse. So there is a real question of what you don't want, and I think what you're worried about, is that that becomes a structural solution. If it's just the temporary solution to get us uh, to, to throw demand into the economy, the world economy when demand on the private sector is sinking so badly, that's, that's the right thing to do. And you know, if we have additional $10 trillion on the debt, you know, if, household, if, if the uh, net wealth of households has gone down by $11 trillion uh, in the U.S. I think the latest number I saw was 13. Larry used 13 now in his latest speech. Maybe it's gone down an additional two since the end of last year. So $13 trillion hole in the uh, net wealth of the household sector. That basically is a hole which the government can try to fill to some extent by essentially building on its own debt. So say 10 trillion. 10 trillion is at interest rates uh, of 4 to 5%. It ends up being a interest burden that the US can endure. The US can endure that in the future. And after all, what you're, if you invest the money properly, you're generating income and wealth and productive capability in the future out of which you service that debt. So I, I just want to say that we, we have to give some room for this, understanding it's not yeah. the structural solution. I, I do I mean, agree with that. I mean, my own view, as you probably, as we know, is that actually the deficit should be bigger now. Yes. So I'm not yes, saying yes. that anything is. Yes. I'm just worried we'll be here 10 years from yeah, now. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's the only thing that will happen, is basically right. Um, I, I think it, it's very important for the U.S to uh, to put together a structural uh, plan to say it won't be that way in 10 years. So the challenge for the administration and for the Congress working with the administration is to define a path off that gets you to a 10-year uh, out debt to GDP ratio or deficit to GDP ratio that looks reasonable. Uh, it also is the, uh, how do you get to the 2050 solution? Because I want to say, if there had been no financial crisis at all, nothing, 
not this, the panic of 2008 didn't occur. We were exactly a year ago, and we didn't know this was going to happen. We still knew that by 2050, at current spending projection lines in the United States, the, the uh, debt to GDP ratio would be approaching 300 percent. Well, if something can't last, it won't. That's impossible position. It was an impossible position a year ago. It's even more impossible now because we're going to build up some debt now. So we actually have to focus on these long-term issues. And of course, the major, major long-term issue is health. So it's funny to talk about health in this context, but it's absolutely essential because if you're trying to find a systemic solution to the world economy and a systemic solution to the organization of aggregate demand in the United States and the systemic solution to the government deficit and debt in the United States, you actually have to start with health. It's a very big issue for the U.S. I want to go to the floor, but I want to ask Laura just one quick, one very quick follow-up. You've been critical of the Clinton administration for which you worked and the Bush administration for not doing more to recognize and then to reverse the slippage or actually the middle, working middle class family being left behind in the growth and gains that we had had. As you just sort of quickly grade what the Obama team is doing, are they embedding in their plan something that will fix that? And that's what I was really getting at with my Wall Street question. Are you basically loading the deck again so that one sector of society disproportionately benefits in ways that were not characteristic of the past? Or do you re see them rewiring a social contract in what they're doing that will solve this very strong criticism that you even gave your own team? Well, I, I think, again, they're, they're trying to, if, if, if you look at where they are trying to um, spend money longer term. They do recognize that a significant uh, burden on these families and a significant source of their long-run problem is uh, the extent of their income being gobbled up by health. They do recognize the uh, problem of the ri another cost line in the United States, which has always been rising faster than GDP, is education. So if you had to look at, OK, where, where do people have to spend their money, and where is the price of the thing they have to spend their money on rising much faster than their overall income? Education one, health is one. I think they uh, recognize that um, we need to consider how to deal with uh, the middle class if we actually do f pursue a policy, either a carbon tax policy or a cap and trade policy, which does increase rather sharply the price of carbon intensive activities. Um, that actually, if you people do a lot of work on this, it is not an evenly shared burden. So you can actually do something uh, there as well. And that's, of course, the proposal on their middle class tax relief. Um, I do think, I just want to point out something uh, that struck me when Martin was talking about the rest of the world. Let's take the hard-pressed economies of, of not, not of Eastern Europe, but, but clearly the economies of continental Europe, even the developed economies, are in difficulty. And uh, Japan is in dire straits, as you said. Think about it from the point of view of the citizen of the country, however. I would say that the American citizen feels in more dire straits, much more dire straits. We're the one that's going to have, and we already have, a huge increase in homelessness. We're the one that are going to have a huge increase in people not with health care. We're the ones that are going to have a huge increase in people without adequate unemployment compensation benefits, either the amount you get or the duration. We're the one who are going to have people who can't afford to get the education they need. Those are all public sector services. The, the, the Europeans are right to say and Jap Japan doesn't say it, but they could, we have a very strong automatic stabilizing si system in effect. And so from the point of view of the citizen going through this massive global structural crisis disaster, it's worse for Americans. It's worse for Americans. Not only did they enter this undercapitalized and over leveraged, but they actually don't have a safety net that is a serious safety net in the key things that Americans have to worry about, where they live, their health care, their education. 
And I think that's a, it's something we don't talk about, but it's a major difference. The Japanese households all this time, decade, decade and a half, I, I don't think that um, my impression from what I've heard and talked to people, they did never experienced quite the way the economists looking at Japan experienced it. Oh my God, Japan's in serious, dreadful shape. You ask the average Japanese consumer, are you in dreadful shape? Uh, the answer isn't quite as dire as we're suggesting. In the U.S., it's quite as dire. It's quite as dire. Outside of Sacramento now, there's a Hooverville. There is literally a tent city, which is growing every day. And the city of Sacramento is now talking about making it permanent. Moving it, but making it permanent. A permanent tent city. So we are developing a Mumbai, uh, you know, there's a sort of road leading into Mumbai, parts of that population, we, I think it's just dreadful. And that's a real difference in the US. Can I just, yeah. the, since you, um, first of all, the, the point about automatic yeah. stimulus, that's the technical part, is automatic built-in stabilizers is correct. And the Europeans particularly, since they have very generous welfare states, constantly repeat this. <laughs> and it is completely correct. I mean, for instance, um, even in the UK, the budget is ex deficit has exploded. And a significant part of that is for this uh, reason. The most interesting thing for outsiders always is what countries take for granted and what countries don't take for granted. In other words, what the implicit social contract is. Mm -hmm. And the implicit social contract in the United States to an outsider um, has two components. The, 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 the formal one is um, we don't look after you too much. We don't pay, insist on you pay taxes. Um, at anything like European levels, so they've remained relatively low. But, and if you take out defense spending, the spending on other things is very, is very modest. But if you fail, you, you fail. That is the, there, is, um, there is, however, a sub-clause to this, uh, in my view, which is unless you're really rich. And now, <laughs> if, now this is not really true. But what, I'm, what I mean by this is, the, the, and it is related to what you say, the language is concerned about the median. The median is only halfway down. Nobody That's talks right. about the poor here. In the UK at the moment, everybody talks about the poor. This is a really different language. And of course, it's perfectly obvious that the rescue efforts of the US government are about uh, preserving um, and helping elite structures. I mean, that's perfectly obvious. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, the language implicit here is, is absolutely clear. Uh, and it is, uh, and it, and and the European way of thinking about this is very different. Now the reasons for that are absolutely clear too. It's where we came from. Uh, we came out of feudalism. You, this country didn't. And the, it's a country of immigrants, far more individualistic, and all the rest of it. But this is the only footnote. It does seem to me what's been going on in the last a year or two in rescuing the, the way the financial system has been rescued is obviously making a lot of perfectly ordinary Americans very, very angry. And I have to say, I fully understand this. So it is surely possible that one byproduct of this crisis will be to shake some aspects of the social contract in the US, as it has been in the last 30 years, and I might say even, even longer. And clearly, this administration, there's no doubt if you look at what it wants to do, is trying to move it in a somewhat more European direction. Mm -hmm. And it equally clearly, there are very powerful forces in this country uh, which want to prevent that. This, to an outsider, is a fascinating thing to watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to take about 15 minutes now. Uh, uh, we're going to take about 15 minutes, start the next panel at 10 15, and we're going to take some questions. Uh, I'm going to ask each of you who, who pose questions to, to identify yourself, ask the one question of the three questions you have, and brevity will be rewarded with cookies or something. Uh, Bob Kuttner, uh, American Prospect Magazine. And I, I will not just call on those people whose names I know, but, but Bob Kuttner. Thanks very much. Uh, I totally agree with what Laura just said. I want to question Laura on the political uh, assumption behind what you said previously, which was that because Congress would not appropriate the money for a more direct government intervention, that the only way to do it was to bring private capital to the table by something like the Geithner plan. I, I would question that on two grounds. One, um, this isn't mostly private money. This is the Federal Reserve putting up upwards, well upwards of 90% of the money. And uh, I think, secondly, 
this was a, a policy of choice. It wasn't a policy of necessity. It was probably baked into the cake when, when Obama hired the team that he did. And so you have Wall Street disgraced but not dethroned. And I just wonder uh, if there wasn't a road not taken that would have been something like an RTC or an RFC where Obama could have tapped the political anger and said, we're going to do this directly. And uh, why do you think that? And lastly, if they had done that, uh, they might well have gotten the money out of Congress. Rather, it's being done in a very opaque way so that the people who brought us this mess can profit from cleaning it up, and that's just going to stoke more populist anger. Was, was that alternative course ever taken seriously as a, as a possible policy, do you think? Thank you. Laura? And if not, why not? Brief the responses answer. can get cookies, too. Yeah. The, the, the answer to your, the, the question, did it, was it ever considered, is I, I don't know. I don't know. I think the situation uh, deteriorated very dramatically for them uh, because the, um, be, because the, you remember before the outrage of the last few weeks, when, when they first came in, the Congress already was enraged and already didn't want to even allocate the additional, the remaining TARP money to the President. I really don't think now, and I don't think even then, that if the, if the uh, government had essentially made it clear that in order to do an RTC-like solution, the amount of government money, and this, this is really what Martin was saying a couple of days ago. So what if the government needs $2 trillion to do that? You think that this is going to be a possible way that the, the, the U.S. The president goes to Congress and says, we need $2 trillion to save our financial system. We're going to nationalize it. We're going to run it. We're going to create a big, huge RTC. By the way, we have to. And this is another thing we could debate, but, but what they have decided. The lesson of Lehman has tied their hands in a very important way. The lesson of Lehman has led them to conclude that creditors must be protected 100%. So a whole solution here, a whole solution here of swapping the debtors out for equity is gone because these institutions are considered to be too big to fail. So around the world, the U.S. isn't the only one that's done that. We insure everything. We insure everything. Okay, uh, we, we essentially say the moral equivalent of a run on, a, on bank deposits, which for which we stopped, is now the equivalent of a run uh, by the creditors. So we have to stop that. We have to keep them whole. Well, I have to tell you the size of the budgetary implications of that for the government are enormous. And I think if you're going to assume that as a constraint, then you're going to have to find another way to mobilize capital. Yes, the, the government does put in all the financing uh, in the sense that it puts in 96% of the financing, but it gets a dollar. The, 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 the upside is a dollar 50-50 share, so the government would get something. Would I prefer, would I think that somehow an RTC-like solution or a, a Sweden-like solution is an easier solution? or a uh, more obvious solution, uh, probably. But we do have this problem. And I think the political problem is very real. And it was very real from the beginning. And finally, let me say, because this was a major thing we discussed last night, the major player here is actually the Fed, the provider of insurance, the provider of the lending capability is the Federal Reserve outside of the current political system, in the, uh, correctly so, correctly so. But we have in the United States now essentially a crisis which is big enough to, is, to be the financial uh, equivalent of war. We have a war-like situation. And we don't have, because it's not a war as perceived by the administration and Congress working together, we don't have the capability in the executive and legislative branch to work together to, to handle a problem of this magnitude. So in comes an institution which does, the Federal Reserve, working with the Treasury. So I think you have to look at it that way. I'll go to Martin here. Um, and I'm going to, there's so many hands up, we're not going to be able, because we've got a, a speaker on our next panel that will have to leave early. So I do apologize to people in advance. But Martin, quickly. Thank you. Writes the Bears uh, Lair. Martin Hutchinson, the Bears Lair columnist. Um, 
since 1995, we've had very rapid monetary growth, uh, much faster than nominal GDP. And in addition, until 2008, you had accelerating um, velocity. And so, therefore, that has uh, kept interest rates very low, created the credit bubble, and indeed increased everybody's reserves. Uh, my question is, shouldn't we be looking at higher interest rates rather than lower ones in order to rebalance the system? Because we haven't looked at monetary at all, but isn't the Fed largely responsible for the mess and isn't the right. solution to change Fed policy? So thank you. So quick question on interest rates and monetary approaches. Martin? The trouble is there's no quick answer to this because you'll have to start dealing with the whole theory of how you think central banks operate. Which is what you want uh, to do, right? Which, uh, <laughs> um, let me say two things. First, my own view is that the Fed, it's quite easy to blame the Fed and perfectly reasonable, but I think the Fed was responding to a situation rather than creating it. And this now gets back to the fundamental theory of how you think a capitalist economy actually works. Obviously, if you have an Austrian view, it, you would have your view, I don't. And therefore, um, there are many others. You can have a monetarist view, which would have your view, I don't. I don't think money is the thing that was fundamentally driving this. I think it was res accommodating it, so you could then say the same thing. It's ultimately responsible for this. Now, once you get a, a situation at the <coughs> end of this process, which is huge credit and money overhangs, I think we agree on that, then the, the really big question is how you deal with it. And there are essentially, and that was the core debate, I think, in the 30s. The, the uh, one view is uh, jack up interest rates, you'll create lots of bankruptcies because uh, you will liquidate lots of banks, uh, the money supply will collapse, you will uh, liquidate lots of paper wealth, lots of com companies will disappear, and it will be a healthy purge, which in my view goes via 50% unemployment. Now, I don't think that's a sellable proposition, and of course, we, if you, you can have other theories about the economy. So I think once you've got here, you have to grow out of it. Now, the, uh, having, I don't have the time to discuss what that means. Uh, it clearly does mean uh, that the present policies of the Fed have to be <laughs> credibly reversible, uh, and it's not at all clear they are, mm -hmm. and it is fairly plausible that the end game of all this will, in fact, be a lot of inflation. And that seems to be plausible. Uh, but given where we are now, I think for the government deliberately to pursue policies whose which, whose premise is that the right resolution of past excesses is an economic collapse, is not a functional policy in any developed country today. Okay, let me uh, take very, very last question, Martin Walker in the very back. And Martin, really brief, we've got to change the stage. So. The, um, the, uh, the, the G20 meeting in November uh, instructed the trade ministers to proceed with the Doha round, not just to stick by uh, the free trading system. Do you think, and Laura, I'm asking you as the author of Who's Bashing Whom, do you <laughs> think that the, uh, the traditional free trading model is going to survive this crisis? Uh, well, first of all, I've, 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 I've never really quite uh, liked the concept of free trading model because I think we've always had a, you know, we've always had a system with a lot of uh, rules and regulations. I personally think, uh, I'm, I'm an optimist here. I actually think that it will. I think, uh, and I, I don't know if maybe I'm, I'm being too optimistic here, I think uh, we have in place a lot of agreements and a lot of machinery and a lot of, and a lot of people who, ha who support that system. It's very hard to unwind something that, th that is that significant and substantial. And we have large companies all over the world that have systematically organized the way they do business to include very significant amount of cross-border trade. And we know from the numbers that a lot of cross-border trade is really done, driven by those, uh, in, by a relatively small number of players who are very large relative to the global economy. So I, I find it hard to see how we do a significant reversal. However, I'll say two things. I think it's very, a very uh, unlikely climate for any significant um, further liberalization for the foreseeable future. So we're in a holding pattern where there will be 
violations. There will be violations. Uh, there will be signs, incipient signs, that countries would like to uh, contain the demand generating effects on employment at home. Uh, we've seen those in the United States. We've seen them in other countries. But I think, I, I, I guess I'm hopeful that those will be marginal uh, backward steps. So no forward progress. It's very hard for me to see that. Uh, marginal backward steps, but not an unwinding of the tremendous investment in the system that has occurred over the last uh, 40 years. Martin? To be very brief, I think if we get out of this reasonably cleanly within the next two years or so, got back to reasonable world growth, uh, where we are is very far from that, uh, then Laura is right. Uh, if, as is possible, we are entering into a lengthy period of mm -hmm. sub-trend global growth, and remember that uh, the, the, the natural rate of growth of the world economy is probably in the neighborhood of 3, per three, 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 three yeah. to 4% uh, or so, and it'll be minus two at least this year, I think. Uh, no, the IMF thinks it's moving in that direction. Uh, the, um, uh, if we don't get back to that, so unemployment becomes chronic, uh, uh, and the imbalances remain very large, I expect countries, particularly deficit countries, to start saying we're not spending all this money to generate jobs somewhere else. So I think for the first time we will be looking at protectionism as a macroeconomic cause, not as a microeconomic cause. And that is what happened in the 30s, and that is what's really frightening. We can manage it as a microeconomic issue for a few years. We cannot manage it generally if we live in a world of chronically deficient aggregate demand, which is unfortunately where I think we are. I think it's a great dis um, misfortune, unfortunately, to such a large part of the American economic profession has decided that everything Keynes said was irrelevant when we actually happen to live in a Keynesian world. Please join me in thanking Martin Wolf and Laura Tyson uh, for an excellent exchange this morning. I'm going to ask people to stay in their seats, ask uh, Martin and Laura to join us off stage. I'm going to ask Jeanette Clonan in this chair to move to the middle chair because we're about to carry these off stage. And let's have some uh, stage management. And as I said, one of our, uh, we need to move rapidly here. Oops, Fred. See you later. Okay, if I can invite to the stage Mark Zandi, Tom Gallagher, Richard Vague, Leo Hindry, Jeff Madrick, and Cheryl Schwenninger. Okay. Folks, if I can have your attention now.